What is up, everybody? Yes, it is Ginger Runner Live, episode number 33. You just watched the trailer for my new film that's dropping next week, Tuesday the 30th, The Squamish 50-50. I'm super stoked for it. The trailer you can watch on YouTube if you want to go back and watch it again and, and, and pull stills of my face in agony and pain. Uh, but tonight is a rad show. Um, we had him on very briefly a couple of weeks ago, and I was... I was really bummed because I wanted to bring him on a full show because he is an extreme ultra runner. The guy is just in incredible. He's on a number of races, some of which are some of the most difficult races in the world, and we're going to talk about him tonight. Uh, he runs his own racing company. He's a race director and puts on some of the biggest ultras. Um, he's awesome. I'm going to welcome him now, Mr. Jameel Curry. What's up, Jameel? How are you, buddy? Hey, Ethan. Thanks for having me on. Really excited to be here. Yeah, of course, man. So excited to have you back in like a full episode version. This is going to be awesome. So get ready. All of you who are watching live, jump into the chat room. Ask some questions of Jamil because tonight we are going to do an excellent episode with him. This is Ginger Runner Live, episode number 33. Ginger Runner. <clears throat> yes! Yeah! 33 what episodes. That That's a catchy. How amazing. Yeah, right? It's like the theme song, it won't, it won't get out of people's heads. People love it. People have sung it to me on the trails. Complete strangers. Uh, <laughs> love my mind. I absolutely love it. Um, so, tonight's episode, I'm super stoked about it. We have an amazing guest. Uh, before we get to him and, and bring him out and... You've already met him, but before we actually like introduce him and, and talk to him about all of the races and the stuff that he's got going on and what he's doing now, uh, I'm going to talk to you about some business-related stuff. So the Squamish 5050 film will drop next Tuesday, September 30th. I'm very excited to share it with you guys. Uh, there, the reason it's taken so long to make it is because there is so much footage. Uh, not only was I racking my GoPro around collecting footage over the course of the two-day race, two days, a 50-mile and a 50K, uh, I had two additional cameras all along the course. Um, my good friend Justin was operating one, and then Kim was operating another, and they were filming various stuff throughout both days as well, so there's a lot of footage. So it just takes a long time to edit, and I don't want to just shove it all together into a movie and just post it. Um, I want to take some time with this one, because it's my A race, and I want to make sure that I represent it well and, and tell a good story. So that'll be dropping next Tuesday. Very excited. Make sure that you're subscribed to this YouTube channel so you can watch that. Uh, also on the front, buffs, a uh, buff update. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Ginger Runner limited edition buffs sold out in under four minutes when I did the first round of them. I could not believe it. So I'm doing another round, and I'm doing pre-orders starting this Wednesday. I don't know what time during the day. Uh, I will announce it via Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. You guys will know. But it will be this Wednesday. I will have those buffs available for pre-order. The pre-order window will be short. It will be three or four days or so. Uh, but it will give you plenty of time to jump on there and pre-order. You don't have to worry about getting in right at 9 a.m. because it's a pre-order, so you have days to, to order that. Uh, and then I will order the actual big mass amount of them, and then they will be shipped, and I will deliver them to you. I'm so stoked to be able to share more of those with those of you who did not get any on the first round. Um, of course, a new website, gingerrunner.com, needs to be completely re-overhauled. Re-overhauled? Just overhauled. And tomorrow is the day that it will be live. Uh, so gingerrunner.com now, go there, go watch it, go look at it, and see what it is now, because it will not be that tomorrow. Uh, at some point late tonight, it'll transfer over to the new website, hopefully, technical issue free. And over the next uh, week or so, if you guys kind of explore it and if you see issues, just email me or let me know, because as with many things tech, it takes some time to kind of figure out if there are issues. So uh, let me know if you guys see anything like that, but I'm really, really stoked on this website. I think it's smooth, clean, awesome, rad, and it kind of fits the style that I really am looking forward to. So I'm really, really excited about that. And finally, the New York Marathon. I am running the New York Marathon uh, with UNICEF, with the charity UNICEF, and I'm currently collecting donations for that. Um, I will have the link in the description of this video uh, in a little bit where you can actually click there and go and uh, donate to the cause. I'm trying to raise $3,500, and I think I'm just just around 3000 left to that I need to collect. So uh, any amount, $10 I think is the minimum, but $10 can, helps considerably uh, for the charity UNICEF. 
I'm really, really excited about that. I'm really excited to finally run the New York Marathon, which is one of those bucket list marathons. It's been on the list since I started running marathons, and I finally get to do it. And I'm actually doing it with a, a big YouTuber friend of mine, Shay Carl, and his whole crew, and I'm, I'm really stoked on that. So all of this info will be on the website, gingerrunner.com. If you want to go there for all of these info and tidbits and stuff like that and information, and also Twitter and Facebook and stuff. That is it for news. That is it for updates. I think it's time that we start talking to him. This is the man of the hour. Uh, okay, so I, I, his resume bullet points are as follows. Um, incredible ultra marathon runner. Uh, incredibly nice guy. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming owner slash co-owner of Aravipa Running, because I think it's you and your brother. Am I correct, Jamil? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Uh, race director extraordinaire. Badass dude with rad hair and tons of really awesome gear, like the Run Steep Get High uh, foam dome that I'm wearing on my head today, um, which is awesome. I love this thing. I've been running in it. You might have even seen it in some pictures and stuff like that. Without further ado, Mr. Jameel Curry. Yeah! How are hey, you, buddy? I'm, I'm doing great. I'm sorry about the long intro. There's, there's usually not so much business to take care of before I introduce my guests, but it's a big week. It's a big week here in Ginger, wor ginger Runner world. You're busy, Ginger. You're doing a lot. Trying. Lot Trying to follow in the footsteps of the greats like yourself, my friend. <laughs> so, um, Jamil, uh, I am partaking in some beer tonight. Um, yes. If you watched last week's show, you'll know that I went to the Stone Brewery for a wedding last weekend, and I picked up a couple of bottles. This is the second and last bottle that I picked up. It is Stone Ruin 10 IPA, a stage dive into a mosh pit of hops, which I'm very excited about. But I'm going to warn all of you, including you, Jamil, this is a 10.8% beer, and it is a big bottle. And I, I don't drink often, I usually only during Ginger Runner Live. So this episode will most likely end up with me being drunk. So just be ready for that. I've, yep. I just had that beer, actually, this last week after our group run here in Phoenix. You did, the Ruin 10. Yeah, yeah, they had it on tap there. Mmm, let's see. Let's see how this is. Mm. Oh, man. That is good. <laughs> yeah. All right, what are you drinking? I know that you've got something special over there. Yeah, I've got, uh, from Santan Brewing Company, we've got the Devil's Ale. And that's, um. a, that's a local one in the Phoenix area here out in Chandler, Arizona. I actually have two. So I'll try and keep up with you. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, so first things first, uh, I, I know that you're from Arizona. You've been in Arizona for a long time. In my mind, when I first started trail running years ago, I was like, places where I wanted to trail run, the Northwest, California, uh, East Coast. Like I know that there's tons of really great trails on the East Coast, uh, Utah, Moab, Grand Canyon. But for some reason in my mind, I'm like, Arizona is all arid, it's all desert, uh, it terrifies me, there's no trees to get shade, anything like that. But some of the pictures and some of the videos that you've posted of some of your group runs, like Arabipa running group runs, uh, and your new, your, the race that you have coming up, the Flagstaff sky running race that you have coming up, which we talked about on a previous episode briefly, they look incredible. And Arizona looks like there's a lot more going on there than just desert. I'm, I'm yeah. an idiot. <laughs> Well, Arizona is an incredibly diverse state. Uh, I was born and raised here, so I've kind of been running and camping around these mountains and canyons my whole life. But yeah, northern Arizona like has the largest ponderosa pine forest in the world, I think they call it. And by the way, Grand Canyon is Arizona. You mentioned Grand Canyon. I did, yeah. Um, it's just it's also one of those things that you you think about the Grand Canyon like it takes up three states. It's its own state. Um, but it is. It's it's all Arizona. You can access it from the north, right? Is that through Utah? Yeah, kind of through Utah. You can get to the north rim, which is about a thousand feet higher than the south rim. But even the even here around Phoenix, like the Sonoran Desert, it can be beautiful, especially more in the winter when everyone else is snowed in. I'm running around shirtless, which is great. Love that. <laughs> Uh, that's one thing I'll never do because uh, I, I would be afraid of blinding people um, <laughs> with with the wonderfully pale ginger skin. Uh, so that's not good. Um, okay, so some of, you're a race director as well, so you put on a lot of races in Arizona, including the Flagstaff Sky Running Race, which is coming up. Um, 
tell us a little bit about that. Like, how did you get into race directing? What made you want to, rather than just run races, direct races? Um, yeah. How long have you been doing it? And like, what's your favorite part about it? I started. Um, I started running ultras about nine years ago, and just instantly fell in love with trail running and the community. And there wasn't a whole lot going on in Arizona at the time, so I just volunteered at what ultras existed, and made a lot of friends, and uh, I was actually offered the Havoline 100 in 2008, or seven actually, and I organized it in 2008. I was kind of interested in, you know, race directing and organizing a race, and my friend had moved out of state and um, gave me the, the race. So that's kind of how I started. It was six years ago with the Havoline 100. Um, and my Which, favorite... You actually just mentioned that the I mean the Havoline 100 is actually coming up. We're almost in October. It's a Halloween race. Um, that's coming up. Uh, and you said that it's sold out with how many people running the 100 mile distance? We're at 550. Oh, that's <laughs> fuck. That's that's a shit ton of people running a 100 mile race at the same time. But I, so the uh, this particular race, the Havoline 100, is kind of legendary in in from what I've gathered, uh, the very first person that I ran with that was an also an ultra runner, that was his first 100 mile race, uh, Eric Skelly of Rock Hard Runners, it was his first 100 miler and he was kind of talking whispers about how so many people show up, everyone shows up in costumes you hit the aid station because it's kind of a washing machine style, and again, correct me if I'm wrong because I have not run it, it's on the list you go back and forth on the loop, and it's a 15.3 mile loop Okay, and is it just crazy? I mean, are there multiple distances, so there's lots of people, and is it just a non-stop party? It's a party. It's like a three-day party. People arrive on Friday, they set up camp, we we rent out tents, so you can just, like, sign up for the race, you can rent a tent and a cot, and we'll set it up for you, you just come up, show up. Only The only crew spot is at the start-finish line, we call it Havelina Headquarters. And so, basically, crews are hanging out for 30 hours... They don't have to drive anywhere. It's it's really easy. So people just, you know, pop out a chair in a pop-up tent and sit around with a cooler of beer and hang out. Watch their runner come in every couple hours and shoo him back out on the trail. That is awesome. Because, uh, you know, what you end up running into in a lot of 100 or even just ultras in general is, you know, you have to, if you're a crew, you have to travel to the different aid stations and you don't get to see your runner very often. In this case, it sounds like you get to see your runner every couple of hours just on the hour. You don't have to go anywhere. You can just hang out and get drunk and wait for your runner to come through. I yeah, love it. You stay put. You meet other crews, other runners. And, I mean, uh, you also get to watch the race unfold. You know, oftentimes if you're crewing your runner, maybe they're mid-pack, um, you don't see the front runners. So this way everyone gets to watch the whole race unfold right in front of them. You see Hal Kerner come ripping through, you know, two hours every lap and... It's a, it's it's so much fun just being out there. Um, I I can't wait to run it. Um, it, it's definitely on the list. Uh, I was I'm always scared because for new races and new distances. In this case, I haven't run a hundred yet. It's on my list, uh, and so I'm really hesitant to just sign up for any any race at a new distance because I'm just afraid I'm not going to be able to do it. Uh, so I'm thinking 2015 is like my year of the hundred and seeing if I can drop in a couple, but Havelina is on the list because everyone has had nothing but amazing, amazing, amazing things to say about it. They just absolutely love it. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm really, really stoked on uh, finding out more about that this coming year uh, and hearing stories and stuff like that. What I really want to talk about um, as well is there, you, you race fairly often. I always feel like I see you um, or hear about you being at races or running races. You very recently ran a race that I feel like wasn't, it was on people's radar last year, but for some reason this year, and that reason is probably Killian and the Solomon team and the, you know, being the final of the Skyrunning series and stuff like that, the Rut 50K, and you were there and you ran it, and uh, tell us a bit about this race, because I only know pictures that I've seen about this race, kind of you know, people say that it's technical, but to me, it looks like a giant mountain ridge just littered with stones and 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 shale and terrible conditions. Uh, tell us a bit about the rut, and was it as difficult as everyone says it was? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, the race is organized by Runner's Edge, is a running store up in Montana. The race directors are the Mike, the North Face Mikes, the Montana Mikes, Mike Foot and Mike Wolf, and they've put together just an absolutely amazing event. You know, I direct a lot of races per year, but this one was just I feel like they nailed everything, like from everything along the way you could ever want in an awesome mountain race. You know, plus it's in Montana. This is my first time in Montana. And it's just, you step off the plane and it's just, it had snowed like the day before. You kind of have that hint of fall in the air. Uh, but this thing is a beast. They designed this to be like a European style mountain race. So the kind of the middle chunk of the race, it's at Big Sky Ski Resort. And okay. they're, they, they send you just on these ridiculous like stone talus covered mountain slopes. And so you're just kind of, sometimes you're on a goat path or a trail, sometimes it's just cross country straight up, and man, it was tough. Like, I got, I, I got beat up out there. I mean, you're an experienced ultra runner as well. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about this in a minute, yeah. but you've run Barclays. You've run really tough races, Hard Rock 100. I mean, obviously the distance isn't even comparable. It's a 50K, but... How does it compare as far as terrain is concerned? I know people who normally run a five or four or three and a half hour 50K. Three and a half hour, is that even a thing? I don't know. Four <laughs> hour 50K. It's a thing. Um, but they were pulling in like nine, 10, 11 hour 50K finishes. So this is obviously no joke. How does it compare to those other races? Yeah, I mean, Killian ran over five hours in this course. And I've done Hard Rock twice. And this, this race I felt like was just... Some of the sections were insane. That's all I have to say. I mean, some of the sections they send you down, they have they installed ropes on the course. Like they, I think they drill. They were drilling like with a rock climbing drill to put anchors in, and they put ropes. And there's ridges, and it was it was tough. Like uh, like Via Ferrata style. What is that? <laughs> um, uh, we talked a bit about about Via Ferrata with Jason Schlarb a couple of episodes ago, and it was like the first time that I really started to research it as well. I don't know what the exact translation is. I'm guessing it's it's uh, via ladder or via ropes, but um, Via Ferrata in, in description is like they take the giant metal staples and put them into rock cliffs or ladders, yeah. um, stuff like that, like yeah. very, very technical, highly exposed. Yeah, there, there's one section called the Headwaters. It was new this year, and they had just a really steep downhill, and they drilled, I think they drilled an anchor in and threw a rope down, and I think probably everyone but Killian used the rope. <laughs> he, he seems like the type that would be like, rope, I don't, I don't need that, and I just, just fall and just let it go. Yeah, usually I'm pretty good, but a lot of, like, the stuff on the Hard Rock course, it's like these little little pebbles, little stones, like when there's scree slopes, you know, little rocks. And you can kind of, like, skate down it as yeah. you go. And kind of, like, go, it goes with you. But with these larger rocks, they're just unstable. They're not big enough to be, to just step on. So they kind of, you hit one, and then it flips up into your ankle. And oh. it's really painful. So you got to kind of take your time. So you're probably much more, yeah, it, it, it probably seems like you have to be much more conscious about where you're stepping, less so, uh, or compared to like this talus field where you can just kind of bomb down a little bit. Or, you know, I've seen the video from yeah. Hard Rock where Killian and, and Timothy Olsen and stuff like that, they're rushing down. You're going to have to tell me the name of that area because you're probably way yeah. more, more familiar with it. Yeah, the, ama yeah, yes, where they're just racing down and you watch Killian do it and he just he just disappears. He's going so fast. Yeah. So but I, I like see stuff game. like that. They're skating, yeah, yeah, they're skating. And it goes with you, but these ones, you have to focus so much just so you're you're stepping on the right rock and you're not going to get a rock jabbed into the bottom of your shoe. It's just, it's different up there. And, um, yeah, you just got to, you got to try and, you got to focus so much. Coming off Lone Peak, I just remember being almost exhausted mentally from having to think so much. Just really? to, like, find where my route was. So, do they have a lot of exposed sections? Like, really exposed? There's... The headwater section was the most exposed. You're, you head along a ridge, and it, it drops away on both sides quite a bit. Um, the rest of it is... And then also going up Lone Peak, you're... You know, that's where the, the vertical K was on Friday. I did that as well. 
Mm-hmm. Just kind of heading along this ridge and then all the way up to the very top of the mountain. And it drops away on both sides. And they had a rope on that section, too. Although it, Got it. it wasn't as necessary on that part. So the course was the same until a point for the, from the vertical K and the, and the 50K? So it used all of the vertical K, but it, it kind of like the very start of the race, we went halfway up the vertical K course and then like dropped down on some mountain bike trails. And then later on at mile 18, you rejoined the vertical K course and then went to the top of Lone Peak. Got it. Uh, we have a question in the chat room from Max. Max Easterbrook asks, is Speedgoat technical or just steep? And uh, I've only heard that it's not necessarily technical. It's very steep and at altitude. But you run Speedgoat. I haven't run Speedgoat, actually. Oh, I could have sworn that you had. Uh, yeah. haven't have you run in those mountains at all? I ha- I've run, I've paced in Wasatch, which I think is near there, but it's not exactly the same mountains. Okay. So I can't. I can't really compare. I know that um, a frequent guest of the show, Billy Yang, ran Speedgoat, and he said it was one of the toughest 50Ks that he's run. And Sage, both Sage and Billy have, have mentioned that. It's very, very tough. But I believe a lot of the toughness of Speedgoat comes from altitude and s- steepness. Uh, Carl does a great job of making sure you get your ass handed to you at that course. Um, I don't. I have not been to that course. I have not run it, so I couldn't tell you if it's technical or not. But... I know that with the Rut 50K, everyone was talking about the technical nature of the course and how it's the first real race in the United States that is similar or at least an homage to a European-style running race. Have you raced over in Europe, Jamil? I have not. I'm hoping to next year. But in in the Rut, it's really it was that middle like 10 miles that was really really technical. The first 13. Yeah, that's what I heard. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly runnable. And and smooth and same with the last uh, the last few miles. Even though I was in no condition to run at that point. Yeah, I was going to ask. So uh, you kind of pulled a Killian in the sense that you ran the vertical K and then you ran the 50K because he's been known to do that. Um, he did that at the rut. He won both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he won both, which is one of those like I don't I don't get how he did it. Uh, he did this a very similar thing after Hard Rock too, which is like come on. Um, when you did this, did it? Did you want to win one over the one over the other, or do better in one over the other? Did you think that the vertical K would hinder your running ability in the 50K, or were you just having fun in both, or kind of what was your what yeah. was your goal going into these races? I was kind of just there to have fun and to experience the event. Since I haven't yet been to like a European Sky Race, I wanted to. You know, just go and experience what the mics have going on up there, you know, because we have our Flagstaff Sky Race coming up. So I wanted to participate in a vertical K before we had ours. So I just, I kind of went up there, no expectations. I wanted to do both no matter what. And, man, I was, like, really sore after that vertical K. My calves were just in knots. Really? So that was kind of surprising. It didn't, I don't think it affected me that much for the 50K. I just kind of didn't have a great day personally, but... You know, still had fun. I got to run with Anna Frost in the middle part for quite a few miles. Um, so cool. that, was, yeah. that was a lot of fun. Just just being with everyone up there and kind of celebrating sky running and, and mountain running in Montana was just awesome. I was going to say that it also seemed like a, like a party in the sense that it was a lot of the ultra running's best. Uh, we're all gathered in this one destination yeah, in, uh, in Montana, like everyone just kind of descended on this small town to yeah. run some epic trails. It it seemed more like everyone was just having fun. Like the days leading up to it, people just out there on the course. You know, Anna Frost tagging the course and and running with flags and stuff like that. Like everyone's helping to kind of make this a really great experience. Um, yeah. Did you get a chance to go up there a couple days in advance and and hang out and have some fun? I didn't really go in advance. I showed up the night before uh, with a with a friend, but. Um, yeah, that was totally the vibe that was going on up there. It was just, it seemed like there was everyone who's anyone in trail running there. You know, the Solomon brought their whole international team because it's part of the World Sky Running Championship. And right. the Solomon guys, man, they just seem to have, like, the most fun that any ultra, like, sponsored ultra team has. Like, they showed up after, they had this giant party afterwards at Whiskey Jack's Bar, which is basically at 50 yards from the finish line. Oh wow! They had a live DJ. They had a mechanical bull. Saw all the Solomon runners show up in costume. 
like Killian walks in with like a female cop costume on, and he's got like a blue wig <laughs> on, you know, like this Killian is like the best mountain runner in the world, and he's just like having a good time with everyone, and that was it was really cool to see, you know, like I don't know if a top runner in any or top athlete in any other sport would be doing that, but that just kind of goes to show you what our sport's all about. And I think that is what it's all about. It's about meeting people and and kind of partying and having fun. That's that's your mantra, right? Um, it, it is. And the reason that really came about was was had a lot to do with the trail running community in the sense that everyone was super welcoming. Um, it, it it while it is a party, it's definitely like a welcome party that anyone can join. There's you know it's everyone is there to have fun and promote the sport and and uh, be friends. And that's what I love about it. I. So wish I had just gone up just to be there and kind of experienced it. Uh, in the chat room, Luis Dor Savard uh, asks, Vertical K is one kilometer or 1,000 feet? What's the typical distance covered? You can so, probably explain this better than myself. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a sky running federation thing. They have a definition. So if a kilometer is 1,000 meters. So it's 1,000 meters of climbing, and it has to be... Five kilometers distance or under, so it's it's definitely very steep. That's thirty two hundred mm -hmm. vertical feet in under a five k, and you just you basically go up and you finish at the top of a mountain or ski resort or whatever. Yeah, it's like on paper, like the numbers. Okay, a thousand feet per mile is essentially what it is. It just has to be under five k, but a thousand feet of ascent per mile. But I tell you, uh, I did a shorter version of uh, Vertical K up at Vancouver. It's called the Grouse Grind. It it kind of it equates out to, I think, two thirds of a Vertical K or like four fifths or something like that, because the 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 total elevation is just around two thousand or twenty two hundred feet or something like that, uh, in a much shorter distance. It's terrible. It is a terrible experience. Uh, I can totally see it being good for training, but I can't imagine racing it. And for you, racing that, and then the next day doing the 50K, I just, my hat is off to you. Actually, your hat is off to you, my friend. Never thought it's I'd ever that. It's essentially a, a power hike, you know, in, in all reality, except for maybe Killian, you know. But I was hiking a lot, and that's just what it's, I, it took me one, I think just over one hour. It was an hour okay. of power hiking uphill, you know, and I think it's it's cool to try different things, and um, I'm glad I did it. It was it was fun. Was that your first vertical K? It was. I've done some training runs that are actually a lot steeper in Silverton when I was training for Hard Rock last year. Mm -hmm. uh, first race as a vertical K, yeah. Got it. Uh, some questions in the chat room um, in addition to the vertical K question. Did you get to meet Rob Carr's brother at the rut? That's from Laundry08. That's actually a great question, because I know Rob Carr's brother was running. Did you get to meet him? Um, I didn't get to meet him. I saw him. I think he placed in age group, but I didn't I didn't get to meet him. I do know Rob from uh, Flagstaff, though, just from living in Arizona, so I'm friends with him. Yeah, uh, I feel like I've talked to you and Vargo, and everyone just seems to be, like, Arizona community is really pretty tight-knit, and everyone knows each other. Yeah. I think that's really cool. Uh, Jamil, what shoes do you run in from Fuller1074? Great question. <laughs> I have this weird obsession with Mizuno running shoes. The Wave Musha is my favorite shoe. I've been wearing it since 2009 virtually exclusively. It's a road, um, it's like a road marathon flat. Mm -hmm. Maybe like seven and a half ounces, um, it's a, it's a road shoe, but I run hard rock in it. It's just what works for me. Unfortunately, they just discontinued that shoe. I was going to say, I've only run in one Mizuno since I hated Mizunos years ago, uh, but it was a Hitogami, and I loved it. And when I started researching more Mizunos, I was like, oh, they're discontinuing a lot of them. Yes. Uh, so they discontinued your favorite Mizuno? My favorite Mizuno. And that the Hitogami is like the replacement for the Musha and the Ronin. Okay. But... They use a different kind of foam now, the Euphoric, which yeah. isn't as durable as the AP Plus they were using before. So that's a little technical stuff. So I'm not very happy, basically. I'm just kind of searching for a new shoe. you got to write them an angry letter, Jamil. you got to write them <laughs> an angry letter. 
uh. something like that. Uh, yeah, with extra, with extra. Uh. Um, yeah, if you guys have any more questions for Jamil, can just continue to ask him because I will ask him on the fly. Uh, all right, let's start talking about. Uh, so the Rep 50K obviously is a race I want to add to my list eventually. I'm really kind of getting into this new, super technical. Uh, I use the term Via Ferrata. There's only been a couple of races in North America that even utilize that sort of thing. The rut used some of it. Um, the very this last weekend, I was going to run it, but I just I couldn't afford the travel costs. Uh, but Gary Robbins up in Vancouver, who does the Squamish race, was teasing about the Sky Pilot race. And if you watch my training for Squamish videos, I actually go up to the Sky Pilot area in episode. Uh, it's either. Two, yeah, it's two, episode two of the Training for Squamish series. And he basically created a race that goes up there and utilizes some Via Ferrata style stuff, like ladders and ropes and all this crazy stuff. And that was this last weekend. I'm really getting into that. So um, uh, hopefully this next year I'll be able to, to do more races like the rut and follow in Jamil's footsteps and maybe do vertical K in, in, in these shorter distances, but still very technical and takes a lot of time because it is so extreme. Um, does does Flagstaff have any terrain like that, like super technical, super steep? Um, and I'm sure you'll utilize something in this sky running race, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're it's a little tough, you know. The great thing for the mics up in Montana is they're operating on Big Sky Resort, which is privately owned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Forest Service permits, they don't have to worry about that. They just kind of have to make sure they're good, like, liability-wise with the ski resort. So they kind of have more free reign. Um, we were still able to, within the Arizona Snowball Ski Resort, which is the ski area in Flagstaff, okay. uh, we're going kind of on this power line cut, which just kind of goes straight up cross-country through grassy slopes and some rock outcroppings. And then on the, the ski lift area itself, we're going up the ski run and the lift line. So it's it becomes very steep, and we're off trail, and you're kind of just hands on knees, the typical like kind of European style of running. We don't have any ropes, but uh, it's, it's steep. So it gives you a, a nice taste of it, about as much as we can do for that race. That's good. I mean... I feel like this race is going to just knock people on their ass. It's going to be awesome. I mean, all the pictures and the video that you posted, yeah. the course is gorgeous. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, and it, it kind of blows my mind that that terrain exists in Arizona. Again, I mean, Vargo has also posted tons of pictures. He's been a frequent guest on the show of Flagstaff. And I just I had no idea that the terrain was anything like that. And it, it really is beautiful. Yeah. Um, I can't I mean, wait. Flag, Flagstaff is at 7,000 feet. And at the San Francisco Peaks, which is kind of, we run along the base of them. They're the highest mountain range in Arizona. They go up to 12,600. The race will go up to 11.5. The vertical K will go to 11.6, which wow. I think is probably Arizona's highest running race. I, I might be able to claim that after this year, so we'll see. That's just high, man. That's high. Unfortunately, it's up there. unfortunately the... Like, the San Francisco Peaks themselves are part of the Kachina Peaks Wilderness Area, okay. and those are restricted. You can't have races there. So we get as high as we can kind of legally within the permitting agencies. No exceptions? No. There is no way you can have an organized race in wilderness. Actually, They actually say you can have no more than 15 people in a group. Oh, wow. So it's, it's actually similar to the new laws that they're creating for the Grand Canyon. It's kind of more, it's more restrictive than even national parks. You can you okay. can have no motorized vehicles, no mountain bikes in wilderness areas. So, mm. well, actually, I mean, I can totally understand that. That's good. It preserves the wilderness for sure. Yeah, it kind of keeps it keeps it wild. You know, it keeps it kind of for the wildlife and for people that want to get away from the ATVs and people shooting guns and all that. So. Yeah, that's yeah. I can definitely see the benefit in that for sure. In the chat room, Jake asks, what gear did you bring with you and what nutrition did you use for the rut? That's a good question. Just nutrition in general. I've always, every athlete that I bring on the show, I'm always really curious what their nutrition plan is. Uh, yeah, so gear and nutrition, Jamil. Yeah, gear, um, it was funny because the, it was kind of had a cold snap, so I would, there was a lot of debate on race morning on what to wear. You was know, it snow the night before or like two nights before? Snow maybe two days before. There was okay. maybe about an inch up high. Um, by race day, it had mostly melted. We we had a little bit. 
Um, but it was probably high 20s, low 30s at the start. And I'm kind of, wow. I run, I tend to run warm. I don't like to wear a lot of clothes when I race. So um, I end up stripping down and just starting in a t-shirt and shorts. Uh, some of my friends, my buddies were wearing tights and jackets. But I just kind of, I figure you warm up in like five minutes. So I just carried um, an Ultra Spire handheld bottle. And uh, I fueled with a lot of salted caramel goose. Love those. Oh, Yeti, Yeti powered, and um, other than that, I let's see, I ate a lot of potato chips on the course, uh, Monster Energy drink, and a hummus roll up. I think that was kind of my main, my mainstay. I mean, honestly, that's like a pretty solid recipe. The hummus wrap, uh, was Monster it mile Energy 20? drink. That was yeah. a mile twenty. Okay, the Monster Energy drink, which is like a hyped up version of Coke, um, yeah. is brilliant. And yeah, the Yeti, the Yeti caramel goose, or it's like so eating good. candy, but like a delicious candy. Oh, it's so good. I'll um, admit, I just eat those around the house sometimes. They're good. <laughs> Not even running. Put, Goo Energy Labs post pictures of people putting it on ice cream, and I'm like, that's actually a brilliant idea because they yeah. they really are that good. Have um, you tried salted watermelon? No, I, I actually got a box uh, that has a couple samples of some of the new flavors. Is it good? I'm terrified it's, of it. It's great. It's awesome. Yeah. Okay. I haven't gotten my hands on any more. Yeah, they're kind of rare because it's still a limited limited edition flavor, and they have lemonade as well, which I've had one of, and it was great. It tasted like yeah, lemonade. Yeah, I, I tried a couple of those. They had them out at the Outdoor Retailer Show uh, this in August. Yes. Uh, another question, this is from Raul, and this is a, this is a really good question because I think Raul actually has long hair. I've met Raul in person. Jamil, have you ever braided your hair before a run? He gets, uh, Raul gets naughty hair when uh, he uses just a hat. <laughs> I, I've never braided my hair. I don't like tying my hair up. I just let it go and mine gets super naughty all the time. So, that's, yeah. I gotta let my girlfriend come out now and again. <laughs> It's, uh, I've actually had that question for Kim, because Kim, uh, my fiancé, my long legs, has beautiful, lush, long hair, much like yourself, uh, but she always yeah. just lets it hang. She doesn't put it into a ponytail or anything like that, and I'm like, doesn't it, doesn't it get in your way, or doesn't it get sweaty? But every time she finishes a run, it looks just as good as when she started. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is that you, you guys are using in your hair, but it's, it's glorious. Yeah, um, I'm not going to talk to her about that, you know. I got some issues. <laughs> I, told I, him, I used to go with like the buff bandana. That was my preferred kind of yes. line method. And I've lately I've just gone with the hat, the trucker hat method. So. Yeah, I mean, if it keeps your hair where it needs to be, then then that's all that matters. Uh, Spirits and nature asked to Jamil, have you ever ran all the way up Humphreys? I have, yeah, many, uh, several times. There, there's actually a great loop that you can do. Um, like 20 mile loop, you go up Humphreys Trail, come down Weatherford and Kachina. Some of the ones we can't use in the Sky Race. Otherwise, we would we'd go up there if we could. Absolutely. You can see all the way to the Grand Canyon from the top of that course and from Humphreys. Oh wow, that's amazing. Uh, another question from Laundry Zero Eight. Do you get to Arizona's highest toilet on the course? <laughs> you do. Arizona's high highest toilet is there, and there's a sign for it. It's at the top. This exists. Yes, it's at the top of the Agassiz Ski Run. I think it's actually in the video on the Run Steep Get High YouTube channel, the, the Flagstaff Sky Race preview I made. Arizona's highest toilet. Sign That's up now. I didn't think that was an actual thing. I thought it was maybe a, a joke in the chat room, but I was like, i got to ask this. So it exists. There is an actual Arizona's highest toilet. There is a toilet at the top of the ski run, and that's Arizona's highest toilet. Yep. Brilliant. I'm so glad that it's along the course so you can do Arizona's highest number two or number <laughs> one, whatever you want. Uh, and speaking of Run Steep Get High, as I mentioned earlier, I am wearing the Run Steep Get High Trucker. One of, I'm guessing, a couple designs that you have. And for those of you who have seen pictures of this, uh, I actually had, I just posted one the other day, and someone's like, oh my god, where can I get that? Uh, Jamil, where can they get this stuff? There, there's shirts and tank tops and hats. Yeah, you can get it all at runsteep.com. That's our, we have an online store there, so you can check out all the gear. It's actually right behind me right here. It ships right right here in Phoenix, so I'll ship it out personally. 
It's awesome. I mean, I'm just now kind of getting into the e-commerce stuff, so I have an absolute appreciation for people who do it out of their home. It is not easy. Those of you who are watching, it is not easy. It's just it's it's time consuming. You got to make sure everything is set up correctly and 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 efficient. Uh, so Jamil does a great job, and and his gear is top notch. It's awesome. Are you going to be accepting orders on your new website then? Is that part of your design? That's part of the design. Uh, I was debating going through a third party. Do you go through a third party or do you go through your own site? It's all on my own site. So that's good. Like a part of me was thinking, oh, well, I could go through a third party, which would redirect people to another site, and I just do all the shipping. But the other side, it was like, this is something that I want to do. Yeah, uh, I, I want to make sure that Square, they're... Square go Market. And I, you know, I'm using like a plugin, so it's it's a lot better, I think. Yeah, I'll be using WooCommerce. That's exactly what I use. And Good. Go, okay. Currently, my payment goes through PayPal, uh, and that you can, yeah, ship labels right from there. So it's really really efficient. Okay, cool. So uh, maybe we can even talk after the show because that is exactly sure. what I'm setting up tonight, yeah. just to make sure yes. everyone can get the pre-order and buttons and stuff like that. Uh, so let's move on to to the next topic that I really wanted to talk to you about which was recently you were at probably one of the most epic races uh, ultra-wise in 2014, and that was Hard Rock. The Hard Rock 100 is one of those races that you just hear legends about. It's easily one of the toughest 100-mile races in the world. There are other ones which we'll also get to later in this, this show, including Barclays. But not only are you dealing with altitude and technical terrain, the distance, but you're also dealing with weather, uh, the San Juan Mountains, um, all sorts of extra factors that you just don't take into consideration with a regular 100-mile race. You were there. You've run it before, uh, but this this year you were there pacing and kind of crewing and volunteering and helping. Um, tell us a, a bit about this race. What draws you to it? The film you made is fantastic. Where, where people can go see that would also be really good. But tell us a little bit about Hard Rock 100 and your attachment to it. Yeah, I am. I'm a hard rock fanatic. It's in my blood. I swear to you. But uh, I, I found out about the race from actually the same friend where I ran my first ultra, which was across the years in 2005. And I he I took over the Havoline 100 from him. And uh, in 2006, I saw photos from that race, and I just I was blown away. I had never seen this, anything so beautiful. Um, and I knew I had to go. I knew I had to run the race, and that was basically my focus for like ultraing. I'm like, I have to run Hard Rock. So I went up there in 2007 just to mark the course and do all of the kind of camp Hard Rock. Like it's such a unique race that people go up two weeks early just to hang out. Like I don't know of any other race like that. Like you don't go to Leadville for maybe some people do, but like. Most people running Hard Rock will go up two weeks early. They're acclimi acclimizing or acclimating. Excuse me. Um, okay, well, I'm making up words too. Trail, trail, they're doing trail work, giving back, and so I went up there. I got to meet a bunch of really cool runners, and um, that's how I ended up running my first hundred miler. I'm like, I need a hard rock qualifier, so I found Angelus Crest was the closest one to me, and I entered as soon as I could, and I ran that in 2007, started applying in 2008, and I've run it twice now. I'm two for seven in the lottery, so I ran it in 2009 and last year in 2013. If I could, I would run it every single year. I go up there every year. I've paced it a number of times. And, yeah, I was fortunate enough to um, pace Timmy Olsen at this year's race since I didn't get in. Now, this is a race that just for, I'm, I, again, I'm an outsider, and I'm looking in, and I'm admiring every single person that tows that start line. This is one of those races that, at least in my opinion, if I ever got into it, it's one of those, it, it's absolute, to me, it's absolutely a pinnacle race. Uh, where everything revolves around it, your training, everything leads up to hard rock, and everything after that is like nothing in comparison. Uh, but as an outsider looking in, I always look at it as uh, something that you strive for, a, a hundred mile race that will definitely throw you for a loop, put you through your paces. It's not about 
what time you finish in. It's about finishing. Is that is that correct? Is it one of those races that you don't necessarily worry about what your finish time is, especially as an elite? Like Timothy's experience this last year is a perfect example. Is it just one of those races you just want to finish? Ab- absolutely. I mean, the two times I've run the race, I've been extremely humbled by that course and by the whole experience. Um, the first year I ran, and I mean, last year I... You're right, like, you talk about it being your focus, and everything leads up to Hard Rock, and, like, last year, leading up to the race, my life was Hard Rock. I, every night, I went up there four or five weeks early to acclimate, Mm -hmm. and I drove my truck up almost every night up to, like, between 11 and 13,000 feet. You know, Silverton wasn't high enough for me at 9,000 feet. I had to go to 11 or 13, because that's and where the live at seven. You live at seven thousand feet. It's run up to fourteen thousand feet. So wow. Like I was obsessed, and I think that kind of hurt me in the end. And we can talk a little more about that. But like I was so obsessed with doing well, and my training had gone really well. I was in the best shape of my life, and I think I put a little too much pressure on myself, um, which okay. is kind of an interesting thing. Like you don't think that can happen, um, but. The first time I ran Hard Rock, I spent two hours on a cot in Ure. Basically, my race was over. I couldn't take in any nutrition for hours. I was running on fumes, so I had to kind of do a reset. And I laid down and eventually got back up and marched on and finished in about 33 hours, um, which is still a really good time. And then last year... Um, I don't know if you heard about my run or my experience at all. Um, no, I and that is why I, I got you on the show. That's, yeah, I yeah. absolutely want to hear about it. So I had kind of like a resurrection. Um, I I don't want to knock this product, but I was training with Tailwind Nutrition kind of before the race. The owners had given me some to try out. And for me personally, um, I found out it has too much sodium in it. I'm not a high sodium user. I'm from Phoenix where it's 110 degrees out. So I was kind of not used to the sodium. I had a lot of anxiety because I put so much pressure on myself to do well. And I got 30 miles in and um, I started throwing up, going up Candy's Peak, which is the highest point on the course. And I was just throwing up kind of like this salty liquid. I think I took too much sodium, and um, basically I crawled over Handy's Peak. There's actually there's a video that was put out by Fred Marmsader, I think, on Darcy Africa. It was okay. from last Hard Rock. You might have seen it. And there's uh, actually a video of me throwing up on top of Handy's Peak in the video. Oh, God. But I was like, I was sitting down, I was crawling. Every time I took a sip of water, I would just throw throw it back up. So I had no calories, no water in me. I was two hours overdue into Grouse Gold Shade Station at mile 42. I then spent over four hours on a cot trying to reset my system. And then um, at that point, the pressure was gone. I just wanted to finish the race, right? So I get back up and start going, and I... I felt fresh at that point. I had kind of eaten a lot of uh, mashed potatoes and kind of everything was just kind of reset. And um, I ended up running the. You took enough time where you could actually get your body back on track, essentially. Yeah, it took it took four hours, but you know, I you have forty eight, so I wasn't just gonna (laughs) point in quitting. Like I might as well see how it goes. You know, I was in seventh place when I started throwing up. Um, So I start out of there. I just feel great. And I end up running, like, I think from that point on, the fastest split of the day. Like, faster than the leader, than the winner of the race. Um, So I end up, when I left that aid station, I was in 107th place out of 140 runners. I had fallen that far back. Wow. And then I finished in 14th place. So I passed 95 people. Oh my in the, last, God. the last 60 miles of the race. And, oh my I, God. and I finished in 31 hours. So it was actually two hours faster than I finished before. <laughs> I, I have not heard that story. I cannot, I cannot believe that that is not 
more spoken about uh, because in ultras, uh, at least in my experience, you you thrive off the stories of resurrection. You thrive off the stories of people who have gone to the depths of hell, managed to turn it around, crawl out of that pit, and then finish a race, whether it's finishing in a position, like a, a podium position, or finishing at all. And in this case, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of not only resurrection and finishing the race, but finishing the race after passing 95 people? Yes. Like, what what is going to your head as you're... <laughs> I mean, sure, you might be counting like, oh, you, you get to like 10 people. I just passed 10 people. I just, oh, I just passed 15 people. Did it's, you lose count after a while? Well, if I, I lost count. It's incredibly motivating to pass people like that. And like, it's hard for me to describe to you like what was going on that night. And Oh, I can imagine. I didn't even run with a pacer. I was just kind of on my own. I had my crew meeting me in a couple spots, but like it was just kind of an out of body experience. I don't know exactly how to describe it. Like I was I was running as hard as I could on these downhills, just almost like out of control, and then just hiking hard on the uphills. And um, kind of the other final story to all of that experience was um, I'm kind of gaining ground and picking people off and I'm coming in past the last aid station. There's four miles to go. I'm running down the Bear Creek Trail. So you run down this trail cross the river, and then you have two miles to the finish in Silverton. Mm -hmm. And I pass another runner. You know, I'm moving really pretty good at this point. I'm feeling good, even though it's mile 96 of Hard Rock. And it's this guy, Rob Youngren. I pass him, and for once, like, he, someone goes with me. He's just right on my heels. So, I, like, I speed up a little, and he's right there. And I speed up more, and he's right there. And I kind of start sprinting down this trail, and he's right on my tail. I'm thinking, what is this guy doing? And we end up racing, like, neck and neck, all the way across the river, across, you know, two miles in, there's a final hill climb, and we're right neck and neck again, four miles in. And uh, we, we do a sprint all the way into the finish line, and this isn't, you know, your standard finish line where you kind of cross the tape and put your arms up. But right. you have to kiss the rock. Yeah. So you're like sprinting to put your face into an immovable object, a giant boulder, and you're oh sprinting. God. So I, I ended up out kicking him um, by one second. Oh my God! Really? Yeah. How do I? I'm honestly I'm blown away that I just I don't know this because uh, a lot of, I mean a lot of the big stories from that race involved Seb. Uh, and you know, I know that there's a huge documentary about Seb and stuff finishing that race. This is incredible. I, I yeah. had no well, idea. So you guys literally sprinted the last four miles against each other to yeah. out kiss the rock by a second. Yeah. <laughs> on, I mean, it was bad. You know, we're 14th, 15th place, so it doesn't really get the headlines. But um, yeah, for me, it was a pretty interesting experience. It, what's what's really funny is I was actually just watching a video today that uh, one of my followers tweeted at me that Hoka11 put out. Uh, it was a beautiful video about Hard Rock this last year that they posted. A beautiful footage, uh, wonderful vistas and slow-mo and all this really dramatic stuff. Um, but they they kind of show some of the finish line footage and people coming into the rock and kissing the rock and, and that kind of thing. And you're like, oh, okay, so most of these finishers are separated by... 20 minutes, an hour, two hours. I mean, the hard rock finishers, it, in, in my mind, they don't finish in a race uh, like a sprint to the rock. It, 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 there's usually big gaps that separate them. But then I started thinking, I was like, well, wait. If two people did end up sprinting to the finish, it's such a hard race that they would probably just like, hey, let's just finish this together. Let's just kind of hold hands and finish it together. But not so. Apparently, you have to sprint the last four miles. Sometimes you do. I mean, I've I've run races before where I've worked together with a runner, you know? Like, we're... Yeah. We help each other, and, like, I feel like that's kind of appropriate to, like, maybe hold hands or, you know, finish together. But this was... This was different, and I've... I've kind of got burned before trying to, like, finish a race with someone I've worked together, and they out-sprinted me at the end. So, yeah. it's yeah. still... It's, I mean, they call Hard Rock a run, but... You know, it, I still want to do my best effort, and we were, we weren't going to give each other an inch. We were both going to just 
go hard till the finish. So that's what it was. And I guarantee you he holds no animosity at all. I'm sure you guys embraced and are, you know, because it's one of those things where it's like, oh, you got me. You know, you got me at the finish. It's, you kind of worked together. Oh, I mean, we were probably you... 10 minutes faster than we would have been otherwise, you know. Not that it matters, like, in the big scheme of things, but it was, right. it was fun, you know. It's something that we'll kind of have have as a, a memory forever, you know. That's an incredible story, man. And And to also think that you finished hours ahead of your previous Hard Rock finish time is despite the fact you took four hours on a cot to reset, is incredible. It's a, little, it's a little frustrating because, you know, I spent about six hours not moving on the course. It was either in a cot or I was, like, sitting on the side of the trail on Handy's Peak. So, yeah. you know, do some math, and we'll see if I get into Hard Rock again what happens. You know, it'd be, it'd be fun to see That's what just happens. It. You know, you... you this I've had to tell myself this the same the same way. Like I I got within two seconds of a PR in a marathon course recently, and I was like, oh my god, that was stopping at an aid station to drink the beer. You know that that two seconds <laughs> happened there. The truth is, is like, well, you don't know, because if you didn't yeah. stop there for that two seconds, maybe you would have tripped, or you you, you just yeah. don't know. You so can't you have to you get can't, your revenge. You can't subtract that time out, but you know it's fun to think about and dream about, and it get, definitely gets me motivated to to see what happens next time. So. Oh, I'm so excited for you, man. That is that is epic. Uh, from an epic race comes an epic story, and I, I can't wait can't wait to see you run that again. And uh, <laughs> if that is the case, I will be there. I will go there, and I will document it, and I will do whatever it takes to film and make sure <laughs> people know the story of Jameel Curry because that is, that is incredible. Awesome. I'll pick you up on that, hopefully next year. Yeah, absolutely. You get those mountains, man. Once you get out on that course, you're gonna be like, "Where's the nearest Hard Rock qualifier?" It's AC. AC 100 is just in my backyard. But yeah. after pacing and and crewing Billy this last year, it's like I never want to run that 100 mile race. It looks terrible. <laughs> it's tough. It's a tough course. That was um, my first. Grid. That was your first. Angeles Crest. Damn, what a first. It's no joke. It is absolutely no joke. Um, but I, I, just looking at the photos and hearing the stories of Hard Rock and the San Juans, it, it's on another level. It, the pictures don't even do it justice. I know that for a fact. And the videos don't do it justice, but it looks incredible. And after watching and seeing everything this year, I'm like, I just want to go. I just want to just be in that small town and be part of that community, just kind of watch and just observe. Um, on those same lines, and we're, we're running a little bit out of time, but I, I definitely want to touch on this. You also ran Barclays, which is, I would say, I, I know nothing about it other than watching all the films and reading the Wikipedia and, and studying this race because it's one of those races, it's, it is legend. This is the race that is legend. It is uh, arguably the most difficult ultra marathon race ever, ever in existence. You ran it, and you ended up finishing the uh, the fun run version of it. I don't even know where to start with this other than can you describe this race or tell us a little bit about Barclays and what it's like to actually be on the course? It's Yeah, it's hard to know where to start because there's so much to talk about. Um, it's, they basically do everything they can do to make you quit the race, to make you fail. You know? <laughs> They're like... Which is kind of the opposite of any other ultra. It's pretty yeah. much, hey, we want you to finish, man. We want you to, we'll we'll let you sleep sleep on a cot for four hours and let you reset your system and get you back out there. No, it's the opposite of that. And it's all, you know, it's all uh, Gary Cantrell. He's the race director. It's all his brainchild, you know. Yeah. But he mm -hmm. really does want to see people finish the race. That's kind of a misconception. He just wants to get you to that point where you're so broken down, you're so cold, you're so hungry. You're so tired that it's like that point where you decide, are you going to quit? Are you going to push on through like the most pain you've ever had or the most difficult situation you've ever been in? You know, he wants you to come to that point and then see, kind of see what you're made of. What are you really made of? Are you up to the task? Are you tough enough? Um, and that's the beauty of it. No other event does that. And this is an evolving race. As runners become stronger and smarter, and they talk to each other, and they give each other tips about the, how to succeed at Barkley, he puts it 
on another level. He makes it tougher. He makes it harder. He throws in another variable that you don't expect. He could change it at any moment and put in a new rule at any time, and you have to then adapt to that. And that's yeah. something that's very... Usually you read the website and you scour it for information. There's no website for this race. There's... You don't even, you can't even find out how to apply. It's like a secret society underground thing. Right. Which is incredibly appealing, you know? Like, it's awesome. And, um, so like, the race that existed five years ago, the one that exists now is way tougher than that. I mean, really? this, this was my first year att actually attending it. Um, I've known people... When the first year I went to Hard Rock in 07... I was in a room full of Barkley, Barkers, Barkley people, and it was like, I'm destined to do this race. You know, I knew it then, and um, it's just like there's, there's no course markings, there's no aid stations, there's an incredible amount of cross country and cli vertical climbing. You know, every loop is, according to the race director, 20.0 miles. You know, he's measured it. In reality, it's probably 26 miles at least. <laughs> oh um, God. But he'll you know he'll change it. He'll add distance, and then he'll just still call it a 20 mile loop. Yeah. Uh, and you know you have 12,500 feet of climbing per loop. Uh, essentially, from the, like the Barkley veterans, they always say each loop is like running a tough 50 mile race. And time wise, I found that to be true. Like. My first loop at Barkley this year took me nine hours. My second loop was 14 and then 16. I did three oh loops. God. And five is the full, the full race. Right. So I was out there uh, for 40 hours. And you have, you have 40 hours to finish the fun run to be considered a finish. And I came in with two other guys in 39.55. Oh, my God. So it was, like, nail-biting. And for us, we knew we were going to be close, like, with eight hours to go. So imagine, you know, you're out there in the middle of the Tennessee woods, and you have to navigate and do all this stuff, and you're like, it's going to be pretty close to 40 hours. We have eight hours to go. Like, that's, it's hard to wrap your mind around that. I mean, even just hearing that is, it, it blows my mind a little bit. Uh, because, yeah, when, when you're running an ultra, you plan ahead. You look at your watch and go, okay, if things are going according to plan, if things stick the way they are, I'll finish in this time or I'll get to this aid station at this time. You kind of plan ahead. So if you're eight hours out of possibly getting a fun run finish, yeah. and, but that's, that's also maintaining the, the speed that you're going at and, and considering nothing else goes wrong or you get lost navigational errors, you know, like, we had to navigate this new section on a reverse loop on that third loop, and um, you're basically taking a compass point, you know, you're setting the degrees, and you're just charging up the steepest hill you've ever climbed. Right. Uh, and there's no aid stations, so, like, if you didn't bring enough food or a change of batteries for your flashlight or you lose your map, you're screwed. Yeah. You're done. Um, the other hard part is it's a loop around Frozen Head State Park. And so you might be, like, halfway around the loop with eight hours to go, but at all point in time, usually, there's, like, a nice, easy trail right back to the start line where everyone's hanging out and drinking beer <laughs> at a campfire. So, like, yeah, you have eight hours to go if you want to finish the loop, but you could be back in an hour on this nice, easy, runnable trail. So... It's a very interesting game he's kind of made up. It's a game. Like, I was surprised because you're, when I started the race, you know, you're thinking, first off, you're, like, really optimistic as a Barkley virgin. You're like, oh, of course I'm going to do five loops. No problem, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you start up the first climb, and you, and you think you're going to pace yourself, right? Like, I'm really going to go slow to begin with and ease my way into this. And... All of a sudden, you're like, people are going faster than I would have liked. And the, the Barkley Virgin, their best chance of success is to follow a veteran, right? 
Mm -hmm. So I kind of picked out my veterans, which happen to be the Abs, Beverly and Beverly Abs and um, Alan Abs. They've okay. they've finished the run a few times, so I was gonna stick right with them. We get to the book one. The, there are like four veterans together, and you have to rip pages out of a book to prove you've been on the loop, right? So they they're kind of like they work together as a team. They rip out their pages, which are all in a row because they've checked in together, so they have sequential bib numbers. So they rip them out, and they head down the off-trail. Off then there's like ten virgins, and we're sitting there. We have the book, and there's ten of us trying to get pages from different parts of the book. So it's like the Hunger Games. Like, we're all trying to <laughs> rip the book out of each other's hands, like elbow each other in the face to get yeah. the pages so we can follow the veterans down the trail. And that, like, your adrenaline shoots up. All of a sudden, you're panicking and freaking out that you're going to lose, like, the person you're supposed to be following. That's inc that's that's too extreme. Because at that point, it's also it's it's also about survival. Uh, it's all about survival. I didn't even, I didn't even think about man, this. And every man and woman is like for themselves. Like <laughs> you just want to survive. That's it. You just want to survive. Yes, your ultimate goal is finishing. Yes, you also have in the back of your mind. That could be impossible, but you know your goal is obviously to do that. But then you, you said something earlier that it didn't even it didn't even click until when you said that it was like no aid stations. For some reason, in this entire scheme of me researching the Barclays, it just never dawned on me. Oh yeah, no aid stations. So every twenty plus mile loop that you've been out on, you've been self completely self sufficient. So if you get into a scenario where you are out there for four, five, six, seven, eight hours additional than what you anticipated, you're fucked. You're totally yeah. effed. Or if it's been raining all night and now it's snowing up on the high ridges, which it was this year. Oh, God. You don't have enough warm enough gloves or enough the, the, the best rain jacket. You're going to be taking, and they call it Quitter's Road. Any of the, tr the easy trails that lead back to camp, you're taking Quitter's Road. You're done. And that yeah. happens. That, that's what happens. That's People, they get in a bad situation or something happens and they they just want to be done and that option's right in front of you. You can just walk back to camp. It's easy. And I have to say that anyone that signs up for this race knows exactly what they're getting into because, like you said, it takes a lot just to even get into this race. A lot of research, a lot of figuring out how do I do it uh, so I imagine anyone that shows up knows there is a very high likelihood that they will be taking Quitter's Road. Um, there was a question in the chat room from Eric saying, seriously, at this point of toughness, is it really fun? Isn't it a bit reckless? But I imagine that because you are signing up for this, you know what you're getting into. It's not necessarily reckless as much as it is the challenge of it all. Or, or do you think it is, in fact, reckless? I mean, sometimes... The way I run is reckless. I don't know, but I think that's part of the fun of it. Um, I mean, I definitely I want to be as prepared as I can for each loop and focus on the goal, which is the goal at any point in time is to get to the next book and to tear that page out and to put it in my page bag and to put it in my pack so I don't lose it. You know, and along the way I want to fuel myself, make sure I'm feeling okay. So you're always focusing on mini goals and you're taking it one step at a time and you know, like, it's an extremely difficult challenge, but, you know, it. I finished Hard Rock a couple times. I've run a lot of 100-mile races. At some point, you kind of look for something more challenging, more difficult, yeah. um, something that, you know, keeps you motivated. Would you do Barclays again? I think that's the big question. If you got a chance to sign up again, would you do it? Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, there, five, five loops is out there. There's only been 14 people that have ever done it. It's it's highest on my list. Uh, again, another one of those instances. If you get in, I'll be there. I'll be out there, and I'll, <laughs> uh, I'll try to document as much as possible. The thing I'll with this race is <laughs> there, there is a film that actually just came out, I believe, this year that someone tried to document the race, and it's really difficult because just getting to these remote locations is really tough, and trying to tell that story is also really tough because it is... It's such a spread out course, and you you know people drop out pretty frequently, and 
you don't know who to follow, like who who to tell the story about, and there's just so much going on with this race, and it is so deep and so difficult and so intense that who knows what sort of story you can tell out of it. But if you get in, man, I just want to like I just want to watch. I just want to watch you start. I'll just show up at that campground and get drunk and like hang out. I just want to watch you start. Oh, That's you, it. definitely. Just to meet meet Gary and meet all the other Barkers, it's it's really a great group of people. It's awesome. Yeah. And Zach in the chat room says, this race sounds terrifyingly amazing, and I couldn't agree more. Um, so we're actually uh, we're running out of time with Jimmy Ol, but of course with all of my new guests, guests that I bring on for the show for, for the first time, uh, there's a little uh, quickie question quiz that I would like to throw him through the gauntlet. Very easy, Jimmy Ol. All I do is ask you questions, and you just answer as quickly as possible. There's There's not many questions. I hope you're up for it. I'm up for it. Okay, here we go. Your first race. Um, cross country meet. High school. The, the furthest you have ever run. 106 miles. What race was that? Mogion Monster. Favorite post race indulgence. Have to be an IPA. And we answered this a little bit earlier, but what are your current running kicks, road or trail? Uh, currently, the Musha. I still have about 12 pairs stockpiled. Nice. Oh, very smart. And your favorite trail? Favorite trail, Havasupai Trail. And finally, your favorite ginger? Ginger Runner. Nailed it. Nailed it. Uh, again, Jamil, thank you so much for joining me on tonight's show. Uh, you have great stories, and you are welcome back anytime. Um, I, I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface of some of the stories that you have to tell in the ultra running world and trail running and, and everything. Uh, for those who might be watching live, and, and, you, and I want them to go follow you, so where can people find you? To give us your social. Uh, AraViperRunning.com. I'm AraViperRunning on Instagram. I'm Desert. RNR on Twitter, or um, let's see, what else? Runsteep.com is for all the Runsteep get high gear. Check it out. Do it. Oh, go and know. Oh, go Run ahead. Sorry. Get high on YouTube as well. YouTube. What was that? Say that again. Runsteep get high on YouTube. And I highly encourage you guys to go check out his YouTube channel, Runsteep get high. Um, they have. Well, I mean, you just filmed at Hard Rock, and some of the videos that you posted from that are beautiful, beautiful. Shows you some of the San Juan mountain range. Um, highly encourage you guys to go subscribe to that channel. Uh, again, Jamil, thank you so much for tuning in live. If you are watching live, stick around. We will hang out with Jamil a little bit in the post show. And uh, if you have any residual questions, ask him in the chat room now. We'll ask him there. You can follow me on all the social networks over on Twitter at the Ginger Runner on Facebook, Facebook.com slash the Ginger Runner, GingerRunner.com, which is going to change tonight to be a whole new website, which I'm really excited about. And do not forget, Wednesday, uh, I will be releasing the pre-orders for the Ginger Runner buff, so you won't want to miss that. It, it'll be open for a couple of days, so if you do miss it, it's okay. But I will announce it on all the social networks, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everything. Uh, and on Instagram, it's at Ethan Newberry, not the Ginger Runner, because that belongs to someone else. That's not me. So there's that. Uh, subscribe to this channel. New shows every single Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And uh, new guests. And Jamil was awesome tonight. So stick around for the post show. We'll ask him a couple questions in there. That is it. See you guys in the post show. That is it. Oh, my God. Dude, Jamil. Talk about stories. Awesome. <laughs> Holy crap. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know about the hard rock finish. That's crazy. Yeah. It was just a different experience. It was pretty nuts. Finishing like within one second of each other, I can't I can't even fathom that. That's like over that course, which takes thirty plus hours, you're out there and in your case you're fighting to to get back up in the field and ninety five people passing ninety five people and then to race a dude until the finish, that's that's incredible. Just yeah. Nuts. Well, and it was weird because as soon as I left that grouse aid station at mile 42 after I got back up, you know, I wasn't really sure what was going to happen. I was all bundled <coughs> up. 
How's that Ruin 10 treating you? Oh yeah. my god, I'm feeling it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm feeling it already, for sure. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I like left there and I, I didn't know what was going to happen and I just felt good and all, like within a quarter mile, I was already thinking like, what time can I run still? How much time have I lost, but what can I run? So I was kind of, mentally I was in the game. I was right back in it. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's awesome. I mean, you still finished. What's crazy to think is the race is open for 48 hours, and you still finished in 31 hours. So you still had 17 hours to finish. Well, and that's the thing. That's kind of the message is, like, unless they're the aid station you're at's reached the cutoff, why quit? You know, you could hang out there for a couple hours, you'll probably end up feeling better. So yeah. you've paid them, you've traveled to the race, why not give it a little time at the aid station? Um, and that's the, the crazy thing. You can be, like, on death's door in a race, and you can come back from that. And I felt the best I did at the end of that race. I was running the fastest at the end of Hard Rock. So... Um, that was, that's, that's an, yeah, uh, at AC100, the carnage at one of the aid stations is later in the race. It's like in, like the mid-60s or mid-70s. Um, it, it was interesting to see everyone run in there and just be completely decimated. They would run into the aid station and they just want to give up. They just want to throw in their, their wristband and, and give up the race entirely. But it was really cool to see a lot of the experts, a lot of the people who have been around the 100-mile scene for a long time, if they were suffering, they would come in and they would just wait it out. And there were people, elites, that would sit there and wait for hours. Uh, when I ran into the aid station with Billy, I was there for a good two hours after he left. And people would run in, sit for two hours, and they'd get up and leave. And they'd still finish top 20. It's it's that patience, you know. It's 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 a lot of thing. Uh, a lot of people forget that that you can be patient in an ultra marathon. And if you need to reset your system, you can completely reset it and then take off and still manage to finish pretty well. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's something they, to remember. They exist with like the highs and lows they talk about. So like if you're like kind of at a low, it's not just going to like keep getting worse and worse. At some point it's going to level back out. It's going to get a little bit better and probably a lot better later on. And that's yeah. and it goes with experience. If you don't know that's going to happen, it's really easy to just call it quits. Uh, your hard rock story is a perfect example of that. Taking four hours on a cot, but managing to reset your system enough where you can finish in 14th place, passing 95 people. Perfect example. Perfect example. Um, in the chat room, uh, Joe Chick, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, a buddy of mine, Joe Chick, has been watching from Ashland, Oregon. He says, you don't drink enough of the high point beer. I couldn't agree more. Apparently it... Uh, it it definitely takes its toll on me. This is the ten point eight percent, and it's I can feel it absolutely, Jamil. So I, I I apologize that your host is already feeling his beer. I don't even know if you've tapped into the second one yet. Oh uh, yeah. Okay, good. I'm okay, so mostly down with it. Uh, Cody in the chat room says, Jamil, you should go by JC since you kind of look like Jesus. Who knows? Well, my last name's Curry, so I've got the initials already. Yeah. Jamil Curry is also Jesus Cristo. Who knows? Uh, and, yeah, Zach in the chat room says he's definitely getting some run steep, get high gear, which is awesome. Wait. Um, I, can't, I can't wait to hear more about the, the Flagstaff race. Um, what made you, like, what, because this is, this is the inaugural year for it, am I correct? Uh, it existed as like the Flagstaff Endurance Runs the last two years. Got it. And but now it's new new courses this year for the Sky Series. What did you have to do differently to did you apply to the Sky Series? How does that work? Like what did you do differently on this course that made it a sky running appropriate course? So we actually we turned it into point to point courses. Um, but basically, we, we're finishing up the Arizona Snowball Ski Resort, and that's what's giving us the additional altitude and the additional climbing and kind of cross-country off-trail that kind of feels necessary for a, a sky race. Got it. Did they have? Did they provide you with like a list of it needs to meet this criteria? Is there certain? I mean, you can't even rate technical trails, but do you just 
before you even apply, do you just know that it has to be a certain technicality or, or, or what? Yeah. They kind of like encourage you to make it as hard as you can generally, but then there's minimum amounts of climbing for the, the stated distance that they kind of they have a standard, a basic standard. Uh, in the chat room, Max asks, uh, Ethan, what hundreds do you have your eye on in the future for your debut next year? And Jamil, what is your next race? We'll start with Jamil. What's your next race? Um, so I was going back and forth about running Mogia Monster this weekend, and I think I've decided not to run it after uh, not kind of doing so hot at the rut. So Hurt 100 is next for me in Hawaii in January. Nice. Have you run that before? You have, right? Oh, first time. It hadn't really been on my radar, but I've got a friend, uh, Michael Arnstein, who lives out there, and yeah. he, he the encouraged me to... The Fruitarian. Up. Yeah. So he encouraged me to sign up for it. The lottery, it's a lottery, so I signed up mm -hmm. for that, and I got chosen, so I'm, I'm headed to Hawaii. Pretty excited. That's excellent. Um, obviously, Gary Robbins, a friend of the show, has dominated that race the last few years, and if you ever need a, a source of, you know, information about the course or anything like that, don't hesitate to reach out to Gary. Cool. Um, well, I know he owns yeah. that, and he's running again next year. That's what's fun, like, just talking to him and seeing his posts and stuff like that post-race is always, I will never run this course again. I'm <laughs> happy with my time this year. But then he always signs up for the next year. Yeah. Uh, that man loves technical terrain. Anything technical, he just loves it, and he kills on technical stuff. I've only heard stories about Hurt. It's it's another one of those races that looks gorgeous, and it runs through some of the most beautiful jungle in Hawaii. Um, it just looks extremely technical. But yeah, there's there's actually a documentary I just found out about. I'm probably gonna buy it. Um, it's about a runner who ran it. He, it's Mark Gilligan who owns Ultra Sign Up. He, oh. It's like a 45-minute documentary, um, so I'm probably going to check that out. But I'm, I'm really excited to head out there. It just it sounds beautiful, and the community sounds awesome. It sounds like anyone that runs the Hurt is just, like, welcomed with open arms to like the, uh, I mean, the Hurt, the Hawaiian Ultra Running Trail community. I think that's what it stands for. Correct me if I'm wrong. Hawaii, but. Yeah, running team or something. Yeah, Ultra Running Team, that's what it is, Hurt. Um, they... They sound awesome, and they're completely welcoming, and it sounds like a really great race, really well put on, amazing volunteer support, and uh, despite the fact that it is a, I believe it's a Y course, where you run out, you run from A to B to C, then back to A, and you kind of do this Y, uh, it's still, it's beautiful, and it's amazing, and extremely difficult, so cool, that's that's excellent. And then, um, yeah, after after that, I'm um, hoping to get into Barkley again, Hard Rock, and then UTMB. UTMB, it's another one of those races. Yep. Excellent. You seem to be really up the uh, the technical alley as well, which is really cool. Yeah, it's my my favorite. I like tough races, so that'll be my focus. Yeah, no what reason to take it easy. What are you eyeing besides yeah. Havelina? Havelina for sure. It's the <laughs> People have always told me if you want to run your first 100, make sure that it has some sort of connection to you. You, you know, um, yes, you can go sign up for um, a race that's like across, like UTMB, uh, obviously on my list. It's one of those races. It's just it looks incredible. It looks gorgeous. It's in an international country. That is obviously on my 100 mile list. But the Cascade Crest 100 is one of those races that it literally is in the backyard that I grew up in, and uh, it's one of those races that. It, it's calling my name. So it could be Cascade Crest next year. That is late in 2015. That's the only big thing is is that it comes late. It's just the week after Squamish. Uh, so I may not run Squamish next year in, in order to run Cascade Crest. Um, but it, Western is also one of those races that if I ever get into Western and that happens to be my first 100, I would run Western as my first 100 because it's it's Western. Um, but Havelina is on the list. Cascade Crest is on the list. AC100 scares the shit out of me. Uh, it is on the list, but I don't feel like I want it to be my first 100. Um, and Hurt 100 is on the list as far as, like, down the road eventually. I don't know. I'm trying to... I'm, honestly, I'm trying to avoid it. I'm trying to avoid it at all costs. 
thinking <laughs> about racing my first 100, but it'll happen next year. 2015 is, is definitely the year for that. So, uh, have you? Do you know much about Cascade Crest? Do you have any friends that have run it or? Have I met the race it? director the first time I went to Copper Canyon in Mexico way back in 2007. So I've heard good, really good things about it. Heard it's beautiful. Yeah, it 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 runs through. I grew up in Redmond, Washington, which is kitty corner to Snoqualmie and and Alpental and uh, Hayak. One of the aid stations is actually at Hayak. Uh, and all those trails out there in the mountains, in the Cascade Mountains up there in Washington State, are, they're, they're gorgeous. They're absolutely incredible. They don't get enough attention. Uh, they don't get quite as high as a lot of the mountains up in Colorado and you know Utah and Arizona even. Um, but they have like the alpine forest up there is lush and green and, and it's really really beautiful. So uh, I definitely have a, a draw to that. So we'll see if I can one get in, two do it. Uh, and three be healthy all, all next year as well, which is definitely the goal. Kyle Roy in the chat room says, was thinking about doing the Crown King Scramble 50K for my first ultra. Jamil, is that a tough course, the Crown King Scramble? Yeah, so that's one of the events we organize. And it has, uh, it's an uphill 50K. It starts in the desert and finishes in the pines, at, and it finishes at a saloon, at a bar, in like, in like a 100-year-old bar. These are all amazing things, by the yeah. way. It's it's a, it's a race that we took over. It was it started in the 80s, and um, mostly it's mostly on Jeep roads, so it's it's not too technical of a course. It's it's kind of a great 50k for maybe for beginners or starters. Um, it's definitely uphill, but that isn't necessarily always the toughest thing. Um, you kind of, it means what's, you, the, what's the net gain? Is there a net, net gain on that? The net gain is about. I think 6,000 feet. It starts around 1,000 and finishes up near 6,000. So it's a climb, but it's a really cool event. Uh, Brandon, uh, I mean, any race that finishes at an old saloon bar <laughs> is, yeah, that sounds awesome. Uh, Brandon in the chat room says, what about Kodiak 100? Now, they just ran Kodiak for the second year in a row this last weekend. I believe it was this last weekend, or if it was not the weekend before. Uh, my experience with Kodiak is only um, secondhand, and last year was the first year for the Kodiak 100, and it didn't sound like it went up well at all. I mean, it, it's a first-year race, and I think they ran into a lot of issues with course sabotage, uh, where people would come in and, and remove course markings, and like they just dealt with a lot of shit last year. This year, I only have heard from 50-mile finishers that it was a much better experience so the Kodiak 100 could be a really great 100-mile race in years future. So we'll have to wait and see with that. I know it runs through a lot of the Big Bear, around Big Bear Lake and in that Big Bear area in Southern California, which is beautiful. It's just gorgeous up there. So if they can get that race organized well and make sure that it's marked accordingly and stays marked for the whole weekend and people are not lost in the woods for 8, 9, 10 hours, then it could be a really good 100 um, have you raced on the east? Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, so you mentioned like the first year hundreds. Um, there's always hiccups with first year hundreds, um, and especially with like newer race directors that don't have a lot of experience. Uh, for me, I kind of I've run a few first year hundreds, which they've ones that have had hiccups and issues, and I kind of like that. It just depends what you're looking for. If you go in expecting there's going to be missing course markers and an aid station might not be where it says it's going to be, it can kind of be a fun adventure, um, but kind of for more maybe more experienced runners. Yeah, no. So I actually had a really terrible um, half marathon experience. This was years ago at the, uh, the Malibu Half Marathon. It was the first year they put it on, and it was a terrible first year for them. Uh, as far as my experience coming from like marathons and half marathons, only this was before I even ran trails. Uh, I ran their half marathon course and was like, how do you get away with not having adults at aid stations or having basically running out of water before half the course even got through? Like there were so many issues with the courses at the time. But at the same point, now that I'm much more experienced in, in the trail and ultra and more self-reliant, I look back and go, I would, I would love one of those kind of monkey wrenches being thrown into a race where you just kind of have to deal with it. 
there's so much learning that goes on in that in that period. You know, where you you learn about yourself, you learn about being self-reliant and, and carrying your own gear and all that kind of stuff. And there is something to be said about that challenge. You know, it's an extra challenge, an extra layer. Exactly. Uh, there was a question earlier from Chris Ham. I'll just throw this in. Would you consider that 50k the hardest 50k? Oh yeah, I saw that one. Go ahead. Probably, I think it's the toughest one that I've ever run. And granted, I haven't run a lot of 50ks, um, but that was kind of the hardest organized 50k. I did run kind of a fat ass race in the White Mountains of New Hampshire a few years back called MMD 50k. They call it more and more difficult. And it was a lot of the Barkley people. It's not a race a lot of people know about, but it's 32 miles across like Mount Washington and, and Jefferson and Madison. Most And there was like ladders and ropes and all kinds of stuff. Uh, no markings. It had 17,000 feet of climbing. So I'd have to oh stay. God. And it took me, there were like seven finishers. It took me almost 20 hours. That's probably the, t that was the toughest 50K I've ever done. <laughs> And that's a fat ass, or that is sanctioned? Yeah, it's it's unsanctioned. It's a fat God. That sounds that sounds incredible and terrifying. Uh, I've heard of the presidents. Check the presidents. It out. Yeah. Have you run? Um, there's a whole range, right? Called the presidents, and it's you know each peak is named after a president. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. It was in that range, so it was running up and down those mountains. Okay. Um, I hear Pine to Palm 100 is a good race from Ben. Uh, I have not run it. My uh, Joe Chick in the chat room has run it. Uh, it's the Hal Corner race, and I've heard great things about it. I've heard it's 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 really tough. I've heard it's really hard. It comes at the heat, uh, heat of summer, like later in the summer. Um, I heard that the cutoffs are really tight, so you have to be really. I don't I don't want to say you have to be fast, but you you do have to be efficient. Um, I've heard it's. A beautiful race, though, and, and a really good 100-mile race. Have you run a Pine de Palm at all? I haven't run it. I've uh, uh, swept it the first year and kind of went and hung out. But, yeah, it's a Mount 100. It, you know, Hal Kerner organizes it, so it's a tough race. From Zach, it says, Ethan, any tips on what to expect weather-wise for the North Face 50, uh, or I'm sorry, Endurance Challenge San Francisco 50-mile 50 50K. I'm assuming uh, he's doing the 50K. Um if I've learned anything from the North Face 50 mile or 50k race, even the marathon and all that stuff that weekend, you you absolutely cannot expect anything until the day before the race. Last year it was beautiful. It was cold, but it was really beautiful. Sunny and the whole race was perfect. The year before was my first 50k on that course and it was terrible. Absolutely terrible. The weather was the worst it has ever been. The mud was a foot thick in some spots. It was absolutely terrible. They had to close the 50-mile course and turn it into a 250K loop or something like that. It was it was miserable. So you really won't know what you'll run into until you get there the weekend of. I mean, that's to be totally honest. Because San Francisco in December, the weather is completely unpredictable. Uh, and yeah, Brandon says 17,000 feet for 50K? Holy crap! And I am I am with that. Holy crap, Jamil. That is yeah. nuts. Were you one of the seven finishers? Yeah. I was last. It doesn't matter. That's incredible. <laughs> Does that hurt your ultra sign up score? <laughs> By being I don't last even out of think seven? that one's on ultra sign up, but I also don't care about that. <laughs> I know. I've I've gotten to the point where it's like, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I walked Sean O'Brien fifty K this year. I think I have a sixty percent from that one. That's, I was going to say, that's actually where we first met. Yeah, you on, it on the trail. I was, like, doubled over, I think. <laughs> you were doubled over, and yeah. I don't know what was going on. You were running the 50-mile, but you, you no, downsized, 50K. right? 50K. 50K. I was I was sick. I don't get sick often, but, yeah, I threw up the morning of the race and just was not feeling well. Oh, even before the race start? Yeah, I wasn't sure oh. I was even going to start it, so... Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're definitely sick. But you finished. Yeah, it was like seven and a half hours, I think. Which is incredible. Uh, people who watch the show regularly know that I have a fear of throwing up. I just hate it. I just can't stand it. So if I was sick and throwing up, yeah, there's no way you're getting me out of the house that morning. There's no way I'd start a race. But you started it and finished it. That's incredible, dude. Yeah. 
But at least I can say I beat Jameel in a race. <laughs> <laughs> he just happened to be sick and completely decimated. That's the, only, that's the only way I can do it. Uh, Joe Chick says, only the first cutoff is stout, but the beginning 50K isn't too bad. I'm assuming that is uh, in regards to the Pine of Palm. Yeah. Uh, ben Fox, I just did my first 50K this year, the SOB, which I'm guessing is Sean O'Brien, and my next race is the 50K Oregon Coast, which I will also be at. Need to work on my mileage before I tackle anything over 50K. Yeah, how do you, um, Jamil, how do you recommend people jump that gap? So people who train for marathons can usually train, I don't want to say easily, but they can usually adapt their training to a 50K distance uh, mm -hmm. on trails. How do you make that jump from a 50K to a 50 miler? Because it's definitely a different race entirely. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'd say including some longer training runs or back-to-back -back days. Um, but in reality, a lo I mean, a lot of it is just mental. It's, no it's knowing that you want it and um, knowing it's okay to go slower early on, walk the hills more, you know, pace yourself a little bit more, I think is an important part of it. In the chat room, Chris Ham says, "Ethan, you should try throwing up and swimming. These are two <laughs> things. These are two things I hate. Uh, so, thank you, Chris. I, I very much appreciate that. Um, okay. Well, I think that pretty much uh, it's going to wrap it up. If you guys have any last-minute questions for Jamil, ask him now uh, as we're wrapping up the show. Dude, I, I honestly, I can't thank you enough. Um, you are welcome back anytime. If you have a race you want to promote, or if you." Anything like that, you just you let me know, Jamil. You are awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Ethan. It's been great. And where can people find you uh, on the social media again for those who are sticking around for the post show? So Twitter is Desert RNR. Instagram is Air Viper Running. Uh, YouTube is Run Steep Get High or RunSteep.com. Yeah, and definitely go check out RunSteep.com. I mean, if you can get any of the Run Steep Get High gear, guys, do it. Support Jamil, support Arab Vipa running. Um, make and sure that they know it on Instagram too. That's a, we have a, a nice big following there. So show up what you got. Oh, it looks like Joe Chick says SOB is Siskiyou out and back, not Sean. I O'Brien. realized I realized that after they were talking about the SOB, I was like, oh, they're not talking about Sean O'Brien. They're talking <laughs> about the Siskiyou out and back. Um, so that's my bad for assuming. Because I know that the uh, the Siskiyou out and back is an Oregon race. And uh, the person who was talking about the SOB was talking about the Oregon Coast 50K as well. Um, be ready for that race. It sounds like we're running in the sand for the first six miles, and that is no joke. The last thing you want to do is burn yourself out in sand for the first six miles, and then run 24 miles completely decimated. Um, it's going to be beautiful. Can't wait for that race. So we'll see you out there. Uh, Jamil, again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, those of you who tuned in live, thank you for sticking around, watching the post show and watching Ginger Runner Live, episode number 33. We'll be back next week, Monday, for episode number 34. I, I can't believe we've made it this far. I'm really, really stoked. And uh, for those of you who listen to the podcast, I am many episodes behind, and that is because of the new website. Because of the new website, I have to completely reorganize all the podcasts. I'm hoping it all transfers over. So I'm hoping all the old podcasts transfer to the new system. Um, that is pretty much the reason why I have not uploaded the new podcast since episode 26 or 27 or something like that. Were you going to say something, Jamil? No, that's it. Thanks, Ethan. You got it. Uh, so that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you did, make sure you go follow Jamil. And let him know. Thanks, dude. Thanks for following and thanks for being on the show. Uh, really, really yeah. rad. Incredible ultra runner. So that's it. We'll see you guys next week, Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific Center time for more Ginger Runner Live. Bye.